Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. We are in uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. As we begin this, I want to go to chapter 5, verse 13, and remind us what this book is about, what he's writing. We know that he wrote the Gospel of John, John did, uh, that they might believe that Jesus is the, the Son of God, that they may have salvation. This book is being written, especially when we begin this topic and help kind of move through the, the subject we're continuing to move through, is this book is not trying to condemn the Christians. It's not trying to tell them. Definitely when you read the book of Corinthians or Galatians, uh, there's a definite problem. Paul is rebuking the people. He's, he's challenging them, trying to get them to come back to the faith. This book is not. He's trying to encourage them not to leave the faith. There's another group over there that seems to be growing, that seems impressive and they're being drawn to it. This book is trying to tell them, no, you're fine. You're good where you're at. And so we can see this in chapter 5, verse 13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I mean, their, their question, I mean, the, you understand, there's, there's a question in them, and you've all had something like this where it's like, well, maybe, what about this? And, and should we, it's like, no, you have the truth. You have the Word of God. Well, should we look for something else? Should we add to it? Should we take it away? Is it really authentic? It's like, you have it, and John's writing them so that you, you are children of God. I'm writing that you know that you have confidence. In fact, it goes on. Verse 14, this is the confidence, and we've talked about this word before, we have in approaching God. And that's the same word when he appears, we'll have boldness before him. The freedom to speak freely. If you're going to speak freely before God, if you're going to pray before God, if you're going to have any kind of a confidence, you're going to have to know that you are saved. That you're not trying to please God, you're not trying to appease God, you're not trying to get something. You're in fellowship. You can be bold with him. He says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. Of course, all these verses, we'll get to them when we get to chapter 5. But the important thing is in verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life, and this is the confidence. If they don't know they've got eternal life, they're not going to access that confidence, that boldness to go to Him in prayer and pursue Him. Now, we go back to chapter chapter 3, looking at verse 4. And we introduced this last week, this right here, uh, pos, po, and here it is. This is the Greek. You can see it, the very first thing. I've got a lot of circles and boxes on your the Greek uh, cut and paste that I've done there. But... You can see right there, it means everyone. But this everyone is it's not saying everyone in the world. These everyones are going to be uh, de defined. It's going to be everyone who and then does this. So everyone, but there's a qualifying portion. And what he's doing here in these verses is he's building on that confidence of the believer. And he's going to say, everyone who does this is a child of God. They've been born again. They have fellowship. They're in Christ. Everyone who's over here doing this, no. They are not in Christ. They do not know God. They are not in fellowship. Now, they're going to say some things, but you can tell by the way these people behave and the way these people behave, the difference. Everyone who does these things is born of God. Everyone who doesn't do these things is not born of God. And he's not trying to, ch to challenge them. You've got to get born again. Throughout this book, he's calling them children. Now, right away, it begins with everyone. But if you look in, in verse, uh, verse 7, he says, little children, or technia. And little children, now he's talking to the believers. And so he's, he's writing to the little children. He's writing to the church. He's writing to the believers. But when he uses this pos ho, he's talking about a qualifying thing so they can know how to distinguish themselves from the others. The other thing we're going to see here tonight, and again, we've got a lot of verses for what we normally do tonight, because I don't want to say this is simple, but it, it's, it's a package, is one, we're going to identify Jesus and we're going to identify the devil. And Jesus, we're going to give him 
his nature, and we're going to identify his mission. And his nature is going to be not, it's going to be no sin, and his mission was to destroy sin. So, if you are of Jesus, you understand, Jesus, and if you've been born, again, you're not trying to copy Jesus, you're not trying to use him as a role model, you've been born, again, of the same seed. You have the same nature. You have the same mission. How can someone be embracing sin, misidentifying sin, uh, letting sin grow in their life without being convicted by it, if they've been born of God whose nature is no sin, whose mission was to destroy sin? It, it doesn't even make sense. It, you can't. Now, we should look at this verse 2 to keep this in balance. Go back to chapter, chapter 1, verse 18. I mean, this is... Again, this can become very, very condemning whenever you talk about sin and sinning because we know we all sin. We all think things, do things, say things that are sin. And, and it's like, well, I, I guess I sinned today. Maybe I'm not born again. This book is not trying to call into question your salvation. It's like, well, maybe I'm not born again. There are books, there are places in the Scriptures that will challenge that. This book, the purpose for John writing this, we just read it, is that you may have confidence. You are born of him. And now he's identifying this is how you can tell you're born again and they're not. And the, idea, the reason for identifying them as not born again is that you don't go over there. Do not, he's going to use the phrase, let them lead you astray. Don't, no, that, they don't have anything. And so Jesus' nature, oh, I was going to read this, chapter 1, verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So if any, you're not here and say, well, I, I never sin. Because if you say you never sin, you don't have the truth. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, and right there, that's John including himself in the we, confess our sins, he is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. So we're not talking about perfectionism here. We're not talking about someone slipping into sin or someone dealing with sin in life. We're clearly, if someone identifies sin, even if they're struggling with a sin and they can identify this is sin and I, I, I want to get out of this sin, we're still in healthy territory. It's this group over here that they're, they have the sin, and instead of struggling with the sin, they're not struggling with the sin because their, their nature is not born again. They're not going to struggle with the sin. What they're going to do with the sin is re-identify. They're going to compromise. They're going to call it acceptable. They're going to call it natural. They're going to be able to eventually say they have no sin. You see, Christians will always be able to say, if they're in the light, I'm dealing with sin. Why? Because you identify. We, we have a sin nature, so there's going to be sin, and you should be able to identify sin. The problem's going to come if you say, you know, I really don't have any problem with sin. I, I, it's like, okay, that's this group over here that has no sin. Now, again, there's also in this whole concept, we're going to get into some words that are mean habitual, the way you practice your life. There's, there's going to be growth. I think at the same time, we're not making an ex We can see also as we go into chapter 2, he said, I, I, well, let's go on to chapter 2, verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks it to the Father in our defense. He's their atoning sacrifice. And so he says, I'm writing this so you do not sin. I mean, he identifies very clearly. This teaching is not to say, oh, well, we all sin. Just let it slide. If you go that far, that's the pendulum swing back over to this side. False teaching is either going to misidentify sin or say it's no big deal, everyone sins. Christians are going to be able to identify sin, they're going to deal with sin, and they're going to be growing away from sin. I think we've got to see growth in this whole thing, growing away from sin. Now, we go back to chapter, chapter 3. The other thing we're going to come to in these, in these verses, and that's why I want to try to get through 4 through 10, because we identify, we have Jesus and His nature, is that of he has no sin. So when he comes to the earth, when he appears, he's going to destroy sin. That's going to be his mission. Where the devil, what's his nature? His nature is sinning. It's going to say sinning 
from the beginning. I mean, it's just like Jesus, he has no beginning. You know, he is eternal son of God. But from eternity, he's had no sin. But from the point of creation, the devil has been sinning since the beginning. It's his nature. And what is his work? It's going to say when Jesus Christ came, he came to destroy sin. Over here we can say that. But in this verse over here, it's going to say Jesus came or appeared to destroy Satan's work. And what is Satan's work? Satan's work was sin. Jesus' mission was to, to destroy sin. Satan's work is sin. So here's, your, here's the list right here. Jesus' nature, he has no sin, and he comes to destroy sin. You are of this seed, so you should be identifying sin, growing away from sin, rejecting sin, and, 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 and being able to grow in Christ. The devil has been sinning from the beginning. So his people are going to continue to sin. They're going to figure out a way to justify it. In fact, Satan's sin in his people is sin. His, or his work is to sin. Jesus' work is to destroy sin in history when he appeared, but also in our lives. He is destroying. Now the word destroy, you've got it in your notes. We'll try to look at it and when we get there. Slow down a little bit. It means to unloose. It means to loosen. It means to unravel. In other words, it's as if the, the things that are holding, like the glue that's holding things together. Even if you think about uh, the, the molecular structure, the things that are holding elements together, if you were just unraveled, unloosened, then the thing that, that makes them cohesive, and it, all of a sudden it's gone, like gravity. If all, the thing that's holding things together on the earth, or holding the planets in orbit, is gravity. It would be like Jesus coming, if he wanted to destroy the universe, he would just unloose gravity, and everything would just go into chaos. That is the word here for he came, his work, Jesus came to destroy Satan's work. He came to, unloose the thing that's holding it together, he came to just, the glue, he just got rid of it. It's like, there's nothing holding Satan's work together. It's unraveling as we go. And so Satan is trying to piece his work together, and Jesus has loosened it, he's paid the price for it, and this is, the, this is what the word is saying right here. So, let's go ahead and look at chapter 3, verse 4. And if you look through those boxes of the Greek, I've got written, I've got a square. You see the very first square I've got on page one. I've got a square around pas o, which means everyone. And there's going to be a qualifying. And I referred to this last week that these verses, again, are going to be talking about everyone and then give you a qualifying verse. Meaning if everyone who is everyone who's of the devil is going to be doing this. Everyone who's of Jesus is going to be doing this. When he says everyone, or pas ho, he doesn't mean everyone in the world. There's always going to be a qualifying term. And he's helping the people. He's helping his, his, his little children. He's helping the believers to be able to see, okay, this is us and this is them. And he's trying to draw a very clear distinction so that his children, the believers, don't go over here and listen to the garbage. And so if you see that square box on chapter 3, verse 4, pas ho, and then you turn the page and you go to chapter 2 and you can see chapter 3, verse 6. You're going to see pas ho again. I've got a square around it for you. In fact, it's in there two times. And we'll get to those verses in just a moment. There's a qualifying phrase about, you know, the anyone. And then you can go back to, uh, well, we, in chapter verse 7, he talks to the little children. And then you go to the back page, uh, chapter 3, verse 9. There again, pas ho, there it's translated anyone. And in verse 10, you've got pas ho again. And it's also mentioned twice, as in the bottom line it says, and also the one, it's building on pas ho. I'm not sure if you can see that right. You know, the, the chapter 3, verse 10, it says, pas ho, anyone not practicing righteousness, not is of God, and also the one, so that just it's just got the H-O or the ho there, the O, it, the Omicron in the Greek, the one, that's again, the one not loving the brother of him. So there he ends it by saying, these are those who are not of God as one. They, uh, they're, they're not practicing righteousness or they're sinning, and they're not loving the brotherhood. They're over there rejecting the brotherhood. So just notice, those, that's kind of tying these all together. Each of those everyones or anyones is John is putting them in this category, because this is Jesus, it's his nature and his mission. And if you're of Jesus, you're growing into his nature, 
you have is nature, but you're manifesting it as you're growing. And that is to destroy sin in your life. If you're of the devil, if you're still in the world, you're still sinning. You've got no power over sin. Jesus has not affected your life. Your sin is still cohesive. It's still being held together. In fact, you're building sin. You're producing sin. You're justifying sin. You're redefining sin. You're giving people more opportunities to sin. And that is exactly what's happening in our culture and even in many churches as they get away from the Word of God. They don't want to identify sin. Is they're over here. They're going to say they're Christians, but they're actually, and we can use this definition right here, if you are promoting the work of sin, you're misidentifying sin. You are doing the devil's work. Jesus came to identify sin and destroy it in a good way, not to destroy us. He's trying to destroy sin in our life. Sin is death. He's trying to destroy it in our life, and that's where we're growing. But if a person, a church, a philosophy is over here, things that are sin in the Christian definition of sin, in the Western world, in in the traditional way of life. And they're progressive. And they're going to say, yeah, sin, it's, that's not sin. That's just an old-fashioned way of thinking. We're going to see things a new way. Well, right there you know. They're over there in that group. It's like, well, are you, you're being judgmental. I'm just teaching the Bible and making application. And if you think I'm wrong, then you're going to have to do something with this. They're misidentifying sin. They're saying sin is not sin. And what a better way to do Satan's work than to say sin is not sin, just keep on going, keep on doing things, and pursue it, develop it, and make it more advanced, and call it progressivism, and make it popular. And so that is what's happening over there in their group, and John is trying to encourage his people not to go there. So here we go, chapter 3, verse 4. Looking at the Greek box, and I'm reading in the NIV, on, on your notes I've got the English Standard Version written there. I'm reading from the NIV. And you can see how the words are coming uh, there in the Greek. Chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Uh, and you can see it with lawlessness there. Lawlessness is used twice there. Interesting, the man of sin, which we know as the Antichrist, the Antichrist, Paul calls him the lawless one. Um... And interesting, lawless, again, we see that in our, we've mentioned before, that's the ideal of having no laws, no regulations, no authorities. It leads to chaos, and that is a good definition of sin. You're taking and breaking down any kind of institution, any kind of stability, any kind of order. God's kingdom is held together with his principles, his institutions, the things he's created. And if you're going to attack God's kingdom, just like Jesus came to destroy the devil's work, he is unloosening his work. It's, it's no longer co holding together. The, the things that are being held together, Jesus untangled them, untied them, set them loose. They won't work. This lawlessness is exactly the opposite of where Satan's coming into God's kingdom or God's world, God's universe, and is bringing lawlessness. He's unraveling the institutions. He's unraveling the truth. He's unraveling the principles. He is lying. I can't spell the word lying. It's got to have to do some fancy stuff with the, word, you know, the vowels there. I can never remember. And so, again, it's into the man of sin. The Antichrist is going to manifest in history as the lawless one. One of the things he's going to, I think you can, you can see it in Daniel, Revelation, Paul's writings, this lawless is going to manifest, just like we, not that we're in the end times. I mean, it's not that Jesus is coming back next week. He's coming back. He may come back next week. We, I, we don't know. But it is going to be one of the principles that Satan has been working from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. You could say the end times were beginning there, where he began to unravel and try and bring about lawlessness, the institutions that God has established. So when you see those things happening in our culture, you can definitely see the end of our culture coming or a turning point or a, something has to happen to bring us back. And that can be tied with the end times. It may not, things may just go on. But lawlessness is going to be a manifestation of the end times. Lawlessness is a manifestation of the end of a culture. Lawlessness is the manifestation of sin 
in someone's life who has rejected Jesus Christ. They're unraveling themselves. So again, lawlessness from end times, the end of history, or the end of, excuse me, the end of a culture, or the end of a person themselves is going to be lawless. That is what we're seeing in that verse right there. Satan is doing the work of lawlessness. So, everyone, and this is again, everyone is a qualifying phrase right here. Everyone who said, everyone means, of course, everyone in the world or whatever, but the, even that, everyone where? In the world. Everyone in Bible class or here. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Sin is the unraveling of what God intends. It's the unraveling of holiness. And again, we've said it before. Holiness is simply doing things the way God intended. When God intended a certain practice, if it be, like we talk so many times about, if it be family, if it be sexuality, if it be work, if it be nations, whatever, whatever God has created, He's got an intention for family. He's got an intention for sex. He's got an intention for work. He's got an intention for nation. He's got these purposes. And when you do family, sex, work, nation the way God intended it, you're being holy. I mean, it's that simple. It's not like, well, sex can't be holy. Going to work, that's just your secular job. It's not, it's not like holy. It is. I mean, biblically, you going to work, your secular job, it's even, it's even blasphemous almost to call it secular because it is something that God has established man to work. And he goes to work, it's holy. A holy person will have family, will have the sex act that we talk about in Hebrews will be done correctly. Uh, work will be included. Nations will be included. This is holy to the Lord. It's not Holy does not mean some special place that you're going to go to the holy mountain. I know we call it that. that. Again, that can be used as set apart, sanctified. But nonetheless, here we go. Chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. It's unholiness. It's the unraveling of God's institutions, His purpose. But, verse 5, but you know that He appeared. Now we're in the next verse. He appeared, and that is, you can see right there, he appeared when, uh, and that would refer to the first time. And it's talking about, uh, I got it circled there two times there because this is Jesus' verse that we talked about at the beginning here where you've got those points. You know that he appeared, and that appearing, as we can go back, I've got it written down here somewhere. Yeah, it's, it's going to be written down there on the boxes in verse 8. That appearing is his first coming, is his appearing. When he came and appeared physically, his appearing, it says, verse 5, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So again, when he comes, his nature, I've already said this, his nature is, in fact, in him is no sin, and when he came, he came to take away sin. And so the point there is that is Jesus' character. If you are in Christ, this is what should be happening to you. And how can law, those who are lawless, those who are sinning, say that they know Jesus? So they, they've seen him. They know him. Not if you're lawless and you're sinning. Again, we all have sin, but if you are not dealing with lawlessness, if you're not dealing with sin, if you're not trying to bring your life under some kind of law. Now, I'm not talking about legalistic law. We're talking about principles that God has established. If you're not trying to deal with sin and bring it under this area here, uh, if you're, you're fine being outside the circle, then you do not know Christ. And so there, that's the definition right there. Verse 4, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared, Jesus, so that he might take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. So there's the contrast. Everyone who, who, who sins cannot be part of Jesus' mission. So those people that are over there, they, they don't know Christ, that other group. And in Him is no sin. No one who lives in Him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen Him or known Him. So there's some interesting words right there. Again, he's clearly talking. Again, notice, this. if you just jump in this verse, again, there's a place to have personal reflection and say, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing here? But again, the purpose of this is not to 
crush the Christians. They're, they're not coming together for church and this letter's being read and they're just being challenged and shredded and they're thinking, man, I need to repent and get right with God. They're, be, they're being told, you are right with God. You've got the truth. Stay in the truth. Keep growing in Christ. We're going we're gonna to grow away from sin. We're going to identify sin. We're going to confess sin. We're going to grow in Christ. You understand, if you identify sin correctly, what do you want to do with it? You want to then confess it and continue to grow. If you don't want to identify it and you want to just cover it over, you're going the wrong way. So everyone who sins breaks law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sin. And in him there is no sin. So his nature is no sin. And he's going to deal with sin. No one who lives in him, which would be the church, the little ones, keeps on sinning. Now again, keeps on sinning. We go back to chapter 1. We know that we're always going to do, anyone who says, I do not have any sin, that's, again, that's a false statement because we all have sin. This keeps on sinning. Go over to page, uh, page 2, the top of page, chapter 3, verse 6. Again, it begins with pas, ho, again, anyone, in him abiding, not sins. So if you are in this circle, you're, you're not sinning. Again, we've got to keep in mind that John has already identified at the very beginning, even when we're walking in the light, his blood is cleansing us because we're always in a sinful state. This is talking about your lifestyle. This is talking about the habitual action. So again, I'm looking on page two in the Greek box. Anyone in him abiding, not sins. Anyone, or there it is again, another the, the box around it, pas ho, anyone sinning, so if you are saying, I, sinning is fine, and you continue with it, that's your lifestyle, but yet you say, now, both these people are claiming to be in Christ. Both these groups. The people that John's writing to and the people that have left. Those that have, have left the group. And they don't, they're no longer fellowshipping with, fellowshipping with the brothers. The first one is anyone in him abiding does not sin. So if you're abiding in Christ, you're not sinning. That's your goal. What do you do? We, we always have sin. We identify it, and we're growing away from it. It's something we're growing away from. It's being loosened in our lives. The next one says, Pas ho, or anyone sinning, has not seen him. And the next one, besides not seen him, not knows him. The people that have gone away, they're saying they've seen Jesus, they're saying they know Jesus, but John is saying they do not have seen him, they do not know him. And you can see that I got a few definitions right there uh, on page two, point one, two, and three. Sinning, the word sinning is the word from, you can see the word hamartia in there. It's hamartanon. It's in the present active indicative which means to sin, but the present means it's a habitual action. So it says, in him, no one sins or they keep on sinning. This is a habitual action. This is a lifestyle that has come to accept sin. This right here, uh, when it says, those who are, are in him, abiding in him, do not sin. It, we know from the doctrine of the beginning of this book, we always are dealing with sin. This is a person who ha is, it's their lifestyle. A lifestyle that has accepted it, like we said before. So over here, those who are sinning habitually, it's, it's their habit. It, it's not their, again, be careful right here too. If a person is dealing with sin, and they, and they, they recognize it as sin, they confess it, and they come back and they got, they, they de and they confess it, they're still, again, you, you decide. They're still over here dealing. They've still correctly got, they got correct doctrine. They know it's sin. They're identifying it as sin. They're confessing their sin. Uh, they're being forgiven of their sin. Hopefully what they need probably is more word, more teaching. They need more understanding. They need to grow in Christ. They need, they need discipline from the Lord, which he is going, he promises in Hebrews, he'll provide the discipline. And so that person is dealing with sin, but dealing with sin is different than habitually sinning. Do you understand the difference? This person may be struggling with sin. This habitual sinning is they've accepted it. It's now their lifestyle. 
It's now they've justified it. Everyone does it. Or it's really not a sin. The Bible's outdated. They've redefined it. It's a personal choice. It's a cultural choice. It's a, and they're habitually sinning. They're not identifying it correctly. Their doctrine's wrong because they don't like call it a sin. They're not confessing it because they can't confess because it's not a sin. They have gone into this lifestyle here of sinning, and they're fine with it. The person that is over here, now see if you can see this difference. The person that is over here has not seen Jesus because he has no sin and he destroys sin and they do not know Jesus. And here's the meaning of those two words right here. Has seen, perfect tense means to see and to experience the continual results of having seen. It's in the perfect tense. Perfect tense would mean you saw it and whatever you saw... You, you can you say, in a sense, it could mean, uh, in a perfect tense, I saw it and I continue to see it, but that would be weird because now you're just staring at this object and you're just always seeing it. It would mean having you've seen him and the results of having seen him are still abiding with you today. It's not something you saw him in the past. Oh, yeah, I remember when I saw him. No, you saw him and you're not still staring at him. You saw him and that encounter is still affecting you in the perfect tense. It just continues on. The results continue. That is what this is. They have not seen him because if they had seen him, the results of having seen him would still be affecting them today. This person over here, they are not sinning. They have seen him and the results of having seen him are still affecting him. Maybe in the sense that even if they're dealing with sin, they continually experience the sense of, I need to repent, I need to confess my sins, I need to get back right with what is correct. I've got to work on this, I've got to continue to grow. This person, they're, they're dead, they're numb to it, they've accepted it. So that's the difference between seeing in the perfect tense. The next one is the word knowing, it's agnokin, it comes from the word ginosko, which is basic knowledge, where we get the word uh, the Gnostics. It stresses a subjective apprehension of what was grasped and having the experience of knowing. In other words, once again, it's, it's, they've, had, they, they've learned this, and now they're, they're using this knowledge in their life. Seeing him, it, it continues to affect them. Having known him, that fact that they've learned, it now is a determining factor in their worldview, in what they identify as sin, how they respond to sin. And again, it, you can see right there, it, it's a subjective, not objective. It, it could, there's another word in the Greek which means objective. This, I know this object. I know this item right here. I can identify it on a, a multiple choice test. I can identify it. This knowing is you know something and that knowledge now is going to have an effect on how you see things. And the person that has no, known him over here, they cannot continue to sin because his nature is to destroy sin, to unloose sin, to unravel sin. And so there, very clearly, I think, there we got that. Verse 6, I'm reading it in the NIV. No one who lives in him, abides in him, keeps on sinning. It's not your lifestyle. It's not habitual. Oh, we know we still have sin, but you're going to identify it. You're going to... You're going to know it's sin. You're going to confess it as sin. You're going to come back to him. You're going to be growing in Christ. That's, again, that's your first... No, in the, in the NIV it says no one. That's, again, that's the pas ho. Anyone and identifies who lives in him. Uh, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. The next one, no one or anyone who continues to sin has neither seen him nor known him. And other, because that would change. So that is identifying those two groups. Hopefully these readers are finding strength in these words. John's intention is at the end of this they're like, okay, we need to stay where we're at and keep growing because these people, they're not sinning over here. They've re-identified. Next verse, verse 7. Dear children, and there again, that's not the pas ho. That's not everyone or anyone. That's his readers. That's the believers. Again, we've said, talked about this earlier in the book. Some people would want to talk about this being maybe the young believers and then there's mature believers that are called the elders or something in this book. I think, and, and, and many commentators would say the same thing, this dear children is just referring to all the believers in the church, not some kind of spiritual ranking. These are little children, and then there's some adults later. Because he's, when he used this, he's addressing them as a group. 
So again, you decide. But I think he's, now he's addressing specifically the children. After having given them some pas ho, as far as everyone, and given them some qualifications, identifying Jesus' nature and saying these people can't be part of Jesus' nature because Jesus has no sin and he destroys sin, he says, now he talks to the dear children, the believers. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. That's pretty flat out, pretty blatant. Do not, that's the issue. That's the entire issue of this book. Believers, do not think you need to go over there. They've got nothing on you. They don't have any kind of advantage. In fact, they don't even know him. They've never seen him. Their lifestyle indicates it. He's giving them some ammunition, actually, to make judgment calls. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Again, that's so. Don't deceive you. It's very simple. If you're going to, what is, just like, what does holiness look like? Well, I define that. Now, John makes it very simple. He who does what is right is righteous. Why? Because Jesus is righteous. If you're in Christ, you're going to do what's right. What does right mean? It means you're righteous. You're in Christ. The nature's there. He who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. See how that's repeated several times. Three rights in there. Now, he who does what is sinful, so there, that's, that's again, he sums up this column right here, Jesus, which was at one point no sin, it's now what's right. Now he, now he builds the Satan column, or the devil column over here that we had before, does the same thing. He's going to give you the nature that I said referred to earlier. Here's where the nature comes from, and the work. The nature of Satan, and the work of Satan. He's done with this topic. Jesus is right. If you're going to do what's right, you're going to be righteous because Jesus is righteous. That's a complete circle. Don't sin. Keep Stay there. Next. Verse 8. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. That's his nature. His nature is sin. In what way? Well, from the beginning. From the, the start of Satan... He was sinning. Again, here's another beginning. We've got the beginning of, uh, of 1 John in the beginning, which was really not a beginning. It's the beginning of the story. Way back in eternity past, uh, God the Son was with God the Father. We have the beginning of man. God made them male and female from the beginning. So we can, very quickly, if you want to do this, You've got the beginning of 1 John, which is the, the beginning of the story. Uh, we'll say the beginning of God, but that's not right. It means the beginning that's not a beginning because there's no beginning of it. Then you're going to have Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. Well, that's not 1 John 1.1. That's the beginning of what? The universe. So God was already there. And then in the beginning of creation, God began there, there are two different beginnings now you've got the beginning of the devil right here he's been a, a uh, where am I at uh, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning we also find out Jesus he's been a liar from the beginning well the beginning of is it is it John 1 1 beginning in the, the beginning that was not no saint wasn't there yet is the beginning of the universe some would maybe put those together What's interesting here is we've got a third beginning, which is the beginning of the devil, which may be the beginning of angels. I mean, they, uh, we can, he's an angel. It's safe to make that assumption. This is not absolute doctrine, but I'm saying you've definitely got three different beginnings. The beginning of John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, but there's nothing else. Because from that point, they're going to create the universe. And that's the beginning of Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created where now we've got Satan's been a, a, a liar from the beginning. The beginning of, of what? Well, beginning of his creation. Now, where does that come? Again, I do not know for sure. Was the, were the angels created before the universe? Were they created during the seven days of creation? Or six? Obviously, were they cr created after? Again, you've got to think about it. Find some verses to support it. I like to think again this is you can become a heretic very quickly I think the angels were created sometime before the universe 
And you've got Psalms supporting that because the angels were doing what when God created the universe? They were cheering, they were singing, they were rejoicing. So you've got the angels, you've got the creation, or not the creation, but you've got the God in existence, 1 John, or John 1 1. You've got the angels, the devil, he was a liar from the beginning. You've got the creation of the universe as a, another, so you've got three beginnings. You've now got, then we said before, you've got the beginning of man. God made them male and female from the beginning. Well, it can't be beginning one. It can't be the beginning of the universe. It can't be the beginning of angels. It's got to be the day six when God made man. Now we add a fifth beginning here in this book that you've had the truth from the beginning. And that beginning is, we'll just say, the beginning of the church, the beginning of the apostolic doctrine, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So you understand, there's five different beginning. Where does the word beginning come from? So here it is right here. We're in verse 8. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil, that's his nature. The devil has been sinning from the beginning. And I would assume, is that the beginning that John's been referring to throughout this book, the beginning of the church? Uh, no, because he was a liar before that. Was it the beginning of when man was created? Uh, I don't think, I think it's, he was beginning from before. So you decided. Another inter interesting thing is when did Satan fall? There was the fall of Satan. Did he fall uh, after the creation of the universe and then God made man? Or was everything in harmony and God made man and then Satan fell and ends up in the garden after the creation of man? Once again, I like to put the fall of, I like to put the creation of the angels before the universe. I think that's very scriptural. I then like to have the fall of Satan before the creation of man because that helps us explain Colossians and Ephesians because God is demonstrating through the church, through mankind in the church, his salvation pro program. He's demonstrating his multifaceted wisdom of his nature to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places, which gives man's creation a purpose for God to reveal himself after the fall of the angels. Again, some of that stuff's kind of, you know, that, if I was going to have a debate or a discussion, that's what I would, in fact, I just did, make that's how I'd present it, and then there'd have to be some kind of, you know, navigating through that. Some of those things I think are pretty scripturally solid. Some you enter into some philosophy and logic on what has to happen first and what can or not. But nonetheless, because I say that because we've been using the word beginning in 1 John uh, as the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the truth coming through Jesus, coming through the apostles, coming to the, this church. From the beginning, they've had this truth. This is not the same beginning. Because the devil was sinning from the beginning, and his nature is... Oh, okay, then go on. I, I'm going to read the rest of that verse. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So, the devil's work is sin, and we knew that Jesus came to deliver us from sin, to destroy sin, and so Jesus is destroying Satan's work. Satan's work is sin. Satan's nature is sin. And this is how we know these people are of the devil because they are sinning. And that is Satan's nature. That is Satan's work. And Satan's work is what Jesus came to destroy. Jesus came to destroy this. So how can you say you know Jesus if you're still sinning? You're still again. We all have a sin nature. We all sin. That's going right back out of John, 1 John chapter 1. The sinning is the habitual lifestyle of having accepted it. You feel comfortable in this environment where the nature is sin, the work is sin, the ruler is Satan because you're still of this world. And so when you come into church, when you come to the Word of God, as these people had, they're going to hear it, but they're going to have to change it they're going to have to change the truth, and this helps you today. They're going to have to change the truth. They're going to have to change the Word of God. They're going to have to change the nature of Jesus and bring it over here into this cosmos system so it all makes sense. So these people have heard John's message. They've been in the church, but it's like they can't handle it. They've got to go away. So they take what they can. They go over here, and they call themselves Jesus people of some sort. But they've redefined Jesus, and actually they are following Satan. And that's what John is saying right here. I'll read it again, verse 7. He who does what is sinful is of the devil. Very simple. If you're sinning, you're of the devil. Well, how do we know that? Because the, uh, Satan, the devil has been sinning from the beginning, 
In fact, the reason the Son of God appeared, again, that's again the word appearing for that first manifestation when he came physically, was to destroy the devil's work. And I, I just want to look here. We're, that's chapter, or that's verse 8. Go to page 3. And there I just got in the box on page 3, chapter 3, verse 8. I've got the devil circled twice, and his nature is there. You see, the devil is circled, and then beginning has been sinning. The devil is circled in the bottom line, and the works of the devil. So his works are sin. He's been a sinner from the beginning. Uh, the word in the, the, the checkered box there, the dotted box, is a word that means, it means appearing. It refers to Jesus first appearing, his physical appearing. And then as it says, the Son of God, on the bottom line or there, I've got an underline, um, it translated, he might destroy. It's luce on in the Greek, luce. It means to loose, it means to destroy. Together it means to destroy by undoing or dissolving the bond of cohesion. So it sounds better if you're not better, but this, you can read it this way. Uh, for this reason, the Son of God was revealed that he might undo or dissolve the bond of cohesion of sin. You know, undo Satan's work. Or undo, dissolve the bond of cohesion of the work of Satan. Which is, again, really good news for us. So that's, that's chapter 3, verse 8. I'm going to read chapter 3, verse 9. Continues. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. He's con just pushing this. This is why I want to do all these verses together. He just keeps pushing the same illustration. No one who is born of God. You're over here. You've got this nature. The nature that has no sin. The nature that comes to destroy sin. To deliver you from sin. If you're of this nature. If you're of this seed. If you've been born of this. It says, will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. Again, you know you're going to deal with sin. That's in chapter 1. But you're going to continue to grow away from it. It's going to continue to be dissolved in your life because you have God's seed. You've got God's nature. You stay in God's word. The Spirit continues to lead you. You're going to be growing away. We, we ended last week talking about sanctifying ourselves. He's saying he's put us here. Now, our job now is to sanctify ourselves in this. And by the process of the Word, the Spirit, the anointing that John refers to, the, the child of God is going to begin to grow away from sin. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. You cannot go on sinning because you're over here. I mean, it gives a lot of credit, a lot of power to the fact that you are in Christ, you have eternal life, that you're at odds with this world. We know from 1 John chapter 1, there's going to be sin, but you're, 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 you're turned away from it. You're trying to grow away from it. It's natural because of that's your nature. He goes on in verse 10. We'll come back and look at this again. This is how we know who the children of God are. Again, he, he's, John thinks it is that simple. He thinks it is that clear. This is how John knows who the children of God are. And he's fully confident that his readers are children of God. He's trying to tell them, this is how I know you're children of God. This is you. He says, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. So again, John appears to have in mind, he can observe, he can be with a group of people or a person, and their behavior, their identification of sin, if they're over here redefining sin, if they're over here hating the brothers, and remember the word brothers, this is not like a, a Cain, Abel, love all people verse. This is the brother. Those who have come to the truth that are in the truth, this is the group you love. This is the group you stay in fellowship with. These people over here, they've got fellowship in their own cultish behavior, but they hate the brothers. How do we know this? We can read 2 and 3 John and see very clear uh, discussion of those people hating John, hating John's teachers, hating the people John's instructing. They want these people to join them in their heresy. And if they stay over here in their brotherhood of the truth from what they've had from the beginning, these people 
hate the brothers. That's what that's talking about. This is not some kind of universal, we love everybody. This is talking about the brothers that have the truth, they stay together. When they drift away and they start picking at you, start trying to uh, speak negative, uh, they were saying very blasphemous things against John. He identifies in 2nd, 3rd John, saying things that aren't true, trying to give John a bad image. They're trying to bring, well, they're running a bunch of false media ads against the Apostle John over in that, that other church that had gone astray. We can see that when we get there. Okay, looking at uh, verse 9 and 10 on the back page, page 4, you can see that verse 9 begins with pas ho, anyone, again that means, and then there's a qualifier, anyone having been born of God, sin does not practice. Again, in the, in the habitual way. So again, if you're practicing sin, you're not one of these anyone's. And again, practicing would be over here where you've accepted it. I mean, again, I can't identify that clear enough. You, you've worked it into your philosophy. You've worked sin. And you just think about all the craziness you read, you see, you hear people talking about. They've taken sin and they, 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 they've eliminated sin from their vocabulary. It's life choice. It's all these different things. It's, it's healthy. It's alternative. It's, it's experimentation. And, and that over here is they've worked sin into their natural philosophy. In fact, it's coming to the point, and it's, it's been like this before, and it's going to be like this again, is the only thing, or the biggest thing, the cosmos is going to call wrong is to say they're wrong. Because if it's over here, there is no such thing as sin. But to say there is sin, that is going to be the ultimate sin. That's going to be, the cosmos is going to call that, well, they've got to call it something. They're going to call it hate. They're going to call it intolerant. They're going to call it whatever. So there's going to come a time, if it's not already here, that those who are going to identify sin, and, and it's just, well, you see it all the time. Over here, no sin. They're going to confess it, get rid of it. Over here, they're going to embrace sin and accept be part of it. So again, anyone having been born of God, sin does not practice because the seed of him in him abides and not he is able to continue sinning. He, meaning you're not able. You, there's something in you taking in and urging you to grow away from sin. It, it, again, it's more than a moral effort. Again, there's a place where we need to sanctify ourselves, but there's also this right here, this seed that remains in him. That's what John's giving credit to. You have eternal life working in you. You have been born again. And that's, that's a force between the Word of God, this, the Spirit of God, You've got the eternal life of God. You've got the seed of God. You've been born again. That is now inside of you. It's repelling sin. It, it's, the Word of God is going to help you identify sin. If you get rid of the Word, you can drift over here. The Spirit is going to lead you to identify sin. The life of God is going to be repulsed by sin. The seed of God is going to keep you alive in Christ. And within this realm... Sin is going to, it's going to be identified and rad, uh, eliminated. It goes on. It says, this is how we know who the children of God are the, and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God. And it gives you two things. He just got done saying, remember that verse a few verses ago where right or righteous was used three times? Now he puts it over here. They're now doing not right. They're not doing right. They are not a child of God. So if you do what's right, you're righteous because he is righteous. If you're over here, you're not doing right. You're not a child of God. You're of the devil. And the other thing he adds to it, he brings up from the previous. If we go back uh, a few verses a few weeks ago, um, it was talking about love, loving the brothers. This is how we know we're abiding in him. We love the brothers. He brings it up again. His topic that we've talked about tonight was sinning or not sinning, doing right or not doing right. You are not of, you're of the devil. You're not in Christ. You do not know him. You have not seen him. If you do not do right, 
and from the previous part that he had earlier in this, these verses, you do not love the brothers. And these are the two things. The reason he's not writing these to condemn them, saying, you better start doing right, you better start loving each other. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, this is how you know. If you're doing right, you're, you're righteous like Christ. You're, you're pursuing. You have the seed. He's encouraging them. But he's saying, if you see people not doing right or hate us who are pursuing Christ, they're of the devil. And what he's doing is he's drawing that line saying, don't go over there. He's, he just got done saying, don't let them lead you astray. So this, those who are not doing right, those who do not love the brothers, are not his readers. They're over there. So that's how that ends right there. Uh, we got one more in chapter 3, verse 10. We've got another box there. I mentioned it earlier, pas ho. And then that drops down in the very bottom line of the Greek box where it says the one. You draw a box around that too because that's just picking up on that other anyone there. So those are all, those pas ho's are all just references with a qualifier to people that they're, they're in a group one or the other. They're either in this group or they're in the Jesus group, one of the two. And how do we know? Everyone who does this is over there. Everyone who does this is over here. What are you doing? And he's, he's not saying, you better look at your hearts. He's telling them, I know you're here. He's not, he's not questioning them. Uh, of course, this, that would, the, the, the topic itself demands that we have some kind of reflection and you know, check our own hearts, check our actions. Not so much for salvation, but are we really pursuing? And I think that goes back to last week where it says you sanctify yourself. You're to be doing some things, pursuing this. If you let this, the best for me, for me, and this might be, per, I think it's more than just a personal preference. I think it's a universal principle. But for me, it's, it's this word. It's, it's hearing this in my life, having it in my life, and, and believing it and knowing this is absolute truth, that this is. This is not an opinion of Paul or an opinion of John. This is God's revelation. This is the truth. This, it, it challenges me. It makes me, when I drift, it, it makes me feel ashamed and wants me to come back and stay in the light. Uh, and again, I think that's the spirit. Uh, but I, I think, you, I, I know this, if, if you close this and just remain ignorant, your mind is going to drift to the cosmos. It's going to drift over here to the philosophies, and you get in a world that we live in with the media. I mean, when I say media, I'm thinking movies, music, entertainment, comedy, uh, everything. It, it, if you're not refreshing your mind, if you're not renewing your mind, if you're not challenging your soul with this word, it's just an education. I mean, I, I, I don't want to say anything bad about education because I'm a teacher. I don't want to lose my job. Uh, I like what I do. I like the people I work with. I got good people I work with. But education, it's not just it's just not we don't teach the Bible. It's like there's a full embracing of the cosmos. Um, there, there, it's 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 a challenge. I got four years left. Um, I, I really want to make it unless I get my full retirement benefits. But you see some things going on, and you hear some of the things people say, and some of the, their their approaches. For, I mean, I, you just got to just I don't know, your lifestyle. You got to let your lifestyle. I, yeah, I can't go into a school and start shooting my mouth off. <laughs> um, I do sometimes. I get upset about something, but you know, you just got to let your lifestyle kind of do its work. Let it speak, because that's that's part of it. Um, but you can't go in there, well, I don't think, unless you want to go down as a martyr. And I'm not ready to go down as a martyr yet. I mean, not as, for, not as my career. You know, that's one of those things. Maybe, I, I mean, it just takes one shooting your mouth off and a couple parent complaints and there. You went down as a martyr. Now what are you going to do? Uh, looking for a job. I've chosen just to kind of live, try to live the life, let the light shine, knowing that this is a cosmos that's working and it's like, Hopefully I can maybe, if I stay, I can infuse some truth. I mean, Daniel didn't burn down Nebuchadnezzar's palace. He just sucked it up and started serving. You know, he just did his job. Joseph went and did his job. I mean, they, you see all these guys. Nehemiah, he was 
right there. He's serving the wine, doing his job. Uh, so there's there's something I that's some I I've, I've had a navigate. I haven't always looked at it that way. I've made some mistakes or gone down as the martyr, but not really the martyr. You like to think it's the martyr, but more just like the stupid mouthy guy that just you know just just shut up. And so, all right, I'll pray and. Uh, Stay encouraged. Father, we do thank you again for your truth. We thank you for your word. We ask that we may walk in the truth, that we again may be convicted by your word. Your spirit would lead us and guide us. But we do thank you for the confidence we have of knowing you and knowing your truth. And do ask that we may manifest your righteousness in our lives at this time in history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to be here.